We begin uh, this morning's worship uh, at the baptismal font with the confession of our sins. And we begin here because it was here that all of our sins were first washed away and we called in to the church of God, to the family of God, to be God's people in the world. So let us wash our sins away this morning uh, here at the font. Let's start with prayer. Almighty God, to whom all desires are known and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit so that we might perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Take a moment now to consider the sins of the past week before we confess them together. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we might delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. And hear clearly this absolution, that not because of, of who you are or what you've done, not even because you've confessed these sins, but solely because God has been revealed to us in Jesus as loving and forgiving and grace-filled. All of your sins have been forgiven as you return to these waters this morning. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. I'm glad that you are worshiping with us today, either live at 10 in the morning on this Sunday morning or later on this afternoon on our YouTube station or, or, or whenever it's convenient for you at our website, messiahlutheran.net. Uh, if you have prayer concerns that you want to be lifted up live later on, start sending those now for Becky uh, uh, who's helping us out here this morning for her to write them down and get them down to me uh, so that we can lift those up this morning. Uh, we are still in the season of Easter. Two more Sundays to go from this season of Easter. So we have our Easter greeting that launches us into worship. Alleluia! Christ is risen! And you respond, Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia! Let us sing. And I still go on 
dance then, wherever you may be. I am the Lord of the dance, said he, and I'll lead you all, wherever you may be, and I'll lead you all in the dance, said he. They cut me down, and I leapt up high. I am the life that'll never, never die. I'll live in you. of the dance, said he. Dance then, wherever you may be. I am the Lord of the dance, said he, and I'll lead you all wherever you may be, and I'll lead you all in the dance, said he. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And you say, and also with me. I am not who I once was, defined by all the things I've done. Afraid my shame would be exposed. Of really being known, but then you gave my heart a home. So I walked out of the darkness and into the light from fear of shame into the hope of life. Mercy called my name and made a way to fly out of the darkness and safe wondering if I could change cause when you're hiding all alone your heart can turn into a stone and that's not the way I wanna go so I walked out of the darkness and into the light from fear of shame into the hope gift uh, for our congregation, those first, uh, the prelude and the first two songs that he led us in. Um, I am encourage you at home to, to sing along with those songs, say the words that are on the screen, because uh, that helps you engage in the music, uh, which is hard to do when you're not surrounded by people in a congregation. And it also helps you hear the story that those words are telling, uh, and appreciate Tyler's good gifts even more. Let us uh, open today's worship with prayer. Holy God, blessed by so many gifts, a richness of gifts, receive our worship this morning as a gift itself for you. Receive it in the highest heavens as a gift, and may it be celebrated upon, and may it bring a smile to the heavenly hosts. Amen. 
Uh, we promised today that we were going to make note of the confirmation youth. We have, uh, I think, about 18 confirmation youth, eighth graders mostly, who are uh, ready to affirm their baptisms here after spending sixth, seventh, and eighth grade uh, in catechism classes led by youth leaders here at the church. Um, and uh, we usually do that the first week of May. We weren't able to do it the first week of May this year because of Oh, well, you know why, all that's going on. Uh, we are still going to do that in, the worship, in a worship service with people. That's really important to what we feel is happening. You're affirming your baptism among the people that promise to live in faith with you. So we need people in the space in order to do that. But we didn't want May to go by without acknowledging these 18 youth that are ready to do this, uh, hopefully in July, if not July, August. Uh, in, in, in the months ahead. So here, here's who they are. In my wrestling and in my doubts In my failures you won't walk out Your great love will lead me through you are the peace in my troubled sea. Whoa, you are the peace in my troubled sea. In the silence, you won't let go. In the questions, your truth will hold. Your great love will lead me through. You are the peace in my troubled sea. Whoa, you are the peace in my troubled sea. My lighthouse, my lighthouse, shining in the darkness, I will follow you. Our reading today is from the book of Acts, the 17th chapter, Acts 17, 16 through 34. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was deeply distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he argued in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons, and also in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Also some Epicurean and Stoic philosophers debated with him. Some said, what does this babbler want to say? Others said, he seems to be a proclaimer of foreign divinities. This was because he was telling the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. So they took him and brought him to the Areopagus and asked him, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting? It sounds rather strange to us, so we would like to know what it means. Now all the Athenians and the foreigners living there would spend their time in nothing but telling or hearing something new. Then Paul stood in front of the Areopagus and said, Athenians, I see how extremely religious you are in every way. For as I went through the city and looked carefully at the objects of your worship, I found among them an altar with the inscription to an unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, he who is, the, he who is Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in shrines made by human hands. Nor is he served by human hands, as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mortals life and breath and all things. From one ancestor he made all nations to inhabit the whole earth, and he allotted the times of their existence and the boundaries of the places where they would live, so that they would search for God and perhaps grope for him and find him, though indeed he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As even some of your own poets have said, for we too are his offspring. Since we are God's offspring, we ought not to think that the deity is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of mortals. While God has overlooked the times of human ignorance, now he commands all people everywhere to repent, because he has fixed a day on which he will have the world judged in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed, and of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. When they heard of this resurrection of the dead, some scoffed, but others said, 
We will hear you again about this. At that point, Paul left them, but some of them joined him and became believers, including Dionysius, Aeropagite, and a woman named Demarius, and others with them. The word of the Lord. Uh, I encourage you to stand at home to give honor to the gospel that we're going to read uh, and this gospel acclamation that Tyler has prepared for us. Our gospel this morning will be from St. John, the 10th chapter. Let's hear this gospel from St. John, starting on verse 15 of the 10th chapter. If you love me, you will keep me, Jesus says. You will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. This is the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. <clears throat> but you know him, because he abides with you, and he will be in you. I will not leave you orphaned. I am coming to you. In a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me because I live. You also will live. On that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. And they, you, they who have my commandments and keep them are those who love me. And those who love me will be loved by my Father, and I will love them and reveal myself to them. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will reveal yourself to us and not to the world? And Jesus answered, Those who love me will keep my word, and my Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words, and the word that you hear is not mine, but it is from the Father who sent me. I have said all these things to you while I am still with you. Is this not what we're reading? But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I've said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not let them be afraid. You heard me say to you, I am going away and I'm coming to you. If you loved me, you would rejoice that I'm going to the Father because the Father is greater than I. And now I have told you all this before it occurs, so that when it does occur, you may believe. I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming. He has no power over me. But I do as my Father has commanded me, so that the world may know that I love the Father. So rise, let us now be on our way. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you. You may be seated. <laughs> If you're standing at home, just a, uh, a, a note in the middle of reading the scripture. I think I introduced it as John 10, and uh, I middle of scripture I realized that, and it's John 14 that I was reading, and then it freaked me out whether you were seeing something different. And I, I know, I, I, I know you, you don't expect much from me, but I apologize for that. Uh, and the reason I wasn't that familiar where that scripture was was because. I've been in this Acts text that uh, our confirmant <coughs> Sabrina read for you so wonderfully this morning. And this Acts text uh, of Paul in Athens, it, it reminded me of uh, the book that we read in the Pandemic Book Club just a few weeks ago, Faith Unraveled. Because the author, Rachel Hall Evans, tells the story of being raised in the church in a way that she is um, focused on evangelism, focused on telling people the good news of Jesus Christ and who Jesus is. And the reason her church is focused on evangelism while she is uh, 
uh, being raised is because they're also focused on people going to hell who don't have a born-again experience. Uh, that, that God is a, a God who, who wants people to go to heaven, but is perfectly willing to send most people to hell. And so it was made real to her that if, if she doesn't tell people the story of Jesus, if she doesn't get them uh, to believe in Jesus, she is taking part in them being damned to hell. And she took this to heart. She, uh, she went to Bible camps as a tween and a teenager where she learned strategies and, and, and learned Bible verses to counter arguments of non-believers. But much of the book is about the premise behind that emphasis on evangelism. Uh, that God is perfectly willing to send most of the creation God made to hell. She started asking questions at 12 years old when her close friend Stephanie wasn't a born-again Christian. She cried with her mom, Mom, I don't want Stephanie to go to hell. Why would she go to hell? And later, as she got older and she became a college student and more aware of the world, she started realizing just how big a place this world is. And she saw news stories of, of people that were born in poverty and, and survived wars and, and died under terrorism and torture and never heard the name of Jesus their entire life. They didn't... Not, <laughs> they didn't say no to Jesus. They never had an opportunity to say no to Jesus. And their life was so hard. Why would God reward a hard life like that with hell? It all stopped making sense. And that's the title of the book, Faith Unraveled. And I shared with the 15 or so that gathered for that pandemic book club that I was a church geek like Rachel Hallett Evans. I was steep, deep in youth groups and camps and everything else like her. But my experience was vastly different. Uh, I was not taught strategies or given Bible verses for evangelism. Evangelism was, was vaguely referred to as something that would be a good idea for us. But it wasn't the main course on the menu. It was, it was an appetizer that we could pick or choose whether to do. And in fact, I would say it was an unappetizing appetizer, like the vegetable tray on that list that no one ever really orders anyways when they go out. I didn't have that experience. And, and, and I speculated that the reason I didn't have that experience was because the God that, that I was taught to, to worship and to love was never presented as a God with an itchy trigger finger to send us all to hell. The God I was taught to love in my youth groups and, and, and growing up in the 70s was a God that I hope you hear about, a, a God that is full of grace and forgiveness and invitation. And when we, I did have questions like Rachel Hall Evans had, like all of us have, what of this hell that is so prominent in Scripture? Who is going to go there, and, 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 and what do they need not to go there? My pastors would respond as I often respond to you when you ask me those questions anxiously. My trust is that a God who, who, who has revealed remarkable love in Jesus is going to be a God of grace and forgiveness when those days of judgment come. But this scripture that Sabrina read from uh, Acts, uh, the story of Paul that Luke, the writer of Acts, tells us, it, it, it convicted me. It, it, it said that uh, I might want to rethink uh, evangelism being the appetizer that no one picks on our menu. Because when I heard that those Greek scholars they were hanging around the square in Athens, that they were groping for God, I was reminded that everyone gropes for God. <laughs> it's part of who we are. 
And, and when Paul describes the shrine in the center of town to an unknown god, Agnostos Theos, it's a shrine that could be in the center of our towns. Because most of us in our groping have shrugged our shoulders and said, well, who can really know who God is? God is unknown. Agnostos Theos. And I believe that all of us are going to grope for God and find some God to fill that hunger we have. Some God that's going to give us direction and purpose. And most of all, hope. And if that God is not the God of Jesus, it's going to be the God of, of retail sales or the God of financial success or the God of self-actualization, whatever that means even. And many of us are simply going to shrug and do our best and say, who really knows who God is? Agnostos Theos. God is unknown. That's what all the smart people in Athens believed. Because that's, that's who Paul is talking to, the, uh, the, the smart people of Athens, or at least the people who thought they were the smart people of Athens. Because <laughs> that's usually... The, you know, all those, uh, all those shrines and temples that you heard uh, Sabrina talk about that, that blanketed the hills of Athens, that made a... a, a rabid, monotheistic Jewish person like Paul crazy. They were disregarded by those Greek scholars. They were thought of as folk art, and some of it beautiful, most of it kind of crass and commercial. <clears throat> they didn't believe it made sense to call God Zeus or Apollo or Artemis any more than it makes sense to call God Yahweh. God was agnostos theos unknown. And when they call Paul a babbler, the Greek word that's used there it makes you think of someone who is a rube or a hayseed. <laughs> when they're calling him a babbler, they're saying that he is stupid enough to believe this stuff about God that he's saying, or he's smart like a fox and is convincing stupid people to believe this stuff. God is unknown. Agnostos Theos. And that's the part of the scripture this morning that, that, that punched my buttons, right? That, 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 that pushed my buttons. Because I have been thought of as a rube and a hayseed by very smart people that are family and friends. I have felt that biting sort of criticism and have withered underneath it. I had a friend years ago that said to me, Carl, you seem so intelligent. Why do you buy into this church stuff anyways? As if no intelligent person would. I had a close family member just a few years ago uh, declare to me that all the science that they learned at college with their science degree has made it clear to them that the God that they heard about in church all their lives just can't exist and doesn't make sense. And that wasn't bad. It was the look I received of someone to be pitied that I'd had this binary choice between science and God and like a rube or hayseed, I'd chosen God over science. Agnostos Theos. All the smart people. Then and now, I think, Shrug their shoulders, have this longing, but what can we really know about God? Well, I can tell you this. Paul is much more confident than I am, which should not come as a surprise to anybody. Paul doesn't wither under this sort of criticism of being called a rube or a hayseed. And, but Paul sees his opportunity, know his obligation to share the story of Jesus but he doesn't relate it to a God itching to send people to hell. His motivation isn't a fear that they're all going to go to hell. His motivation to tell the story is because they're asking about God with this 
shrine to an unknown God. He sees their longing and he acknowledges it. He agrees with them that the gods that are blanketing the hillsides of Athens, they are uh, not God. Because they're smart enough to see just how huge God is in the creation, in the majesty of the creation, the intricacy of the creation, he tells them, and the beauty around them, how it's put together. <laughs> these stone statues and these crazy cults, they can't contain that sort of God. And he surprises them by telling them that the God he's been babbling about isn't a, a God of Israel or a God of, of Greece, or a God of Rome, or a God of Persia, or a God of Egypt. The God he's been babbling about is simply God, who brings breath of life into the entire creation. And that the agnostos theos, this unknown God behind the very mystery of the world, is a God that they are longing to know. That's why they spend their days talking. And the good news is, is that our God longs to be known. And he's revealed God's self in a person of Jesus. To be a God not just for people from Israel or, or Tarsus like Paul or, or, or Athens or, or, or Ephesus or, or Rome, or Spain, or Egypt, or Persia, or America, or Mexico, or Canada. <laughs> that the God that is revealed in Jesus that longs to be known, longs to be known by all people, not just one people in one geographic location. All people, regardless of class, or, or, or race, or, or place in the world, or all people. God longs to be known by us, just as we long to know God. Each and every one of us longs to know God. And I don't believe it's because of a fear of damnation that sends all of us to find a purpose in life a direction in life, a hope for life. And frankly, when I talk to people about hell, uh, they're pretty convinced that they're good people and they're not going there anyways, even if it exists. That's another story. <laughs> no, I think that there's this heart, this God-shaped hole that's in each of us. And there's only one round peg that fits in that hole. And that round peg is the God revealed in Jesus. And, and, and we can shove all sorts of other pegs in there. Square ones and, and triangular ones. And diamond shaped pegs. And we can even shove pegs that nearly fit in there. And our search for meaning and direction and purpose and hope. But the only peg that's going to fit in there well. Is the revelation of God in Jesus. And if I don't share that good news with my neighbor, I don't think I'm damning them to eternal hell. But I do think I'm damning them to sort of a low grade hell on earth of living life always shy of that hope that comes with Jesus, of living life without that peace that passes all understanding. We don't need strategies or, or Bible verses. They would be good to have, don't get me wrong. And, and, and Lutherans especially should be working harder at this. But we just need the motivation 
to love our neighbor enough to keep them from that low-grade hell. We just need ears to hear them when they grope and they ask us questions, even if those questions feel insulting to us. We just need to move the sense of evangelism from the appetizer part of the menu to, to the best side dish of the best course the restaurant offers. Jesus, the lamb who was slain for us. We just need to be able to tell a story about the God and Jesus has called us out of love to live in a community of broken people who are trying to figure out how to love each other and are moved by a hope of being loved forever, whatever that might mean. Or you could even say it's simpler than that. That I am sure, or rather I am unsure exactly who God is or, or where God is, but what I am sure of is that I'd rather live my life understanding God as Jesus than any other way. Doesn't our neighbor deserve to hear this good news? The neighbor we're called to love. Amen. Let us sing. You were the word at the beginning. One with God the Lord most high. You hid in glory in creation. Now revealed in you our Christ. What a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is. The
Powerful name. It is the name of Jesus. Uh, the, uh, that song really went well with the sermon that was just preached. Thank you. I, um, we, we wanted to uh, not let this day of worship go by uh, without giving each and every one of us a taste of, of what these confirmation youth are going to share in the midst of us sometime soon. They're going to affirm their baptism. They're going to say what happened in the waters of baptism for many of them when they were infants, some when they just a few weeks ago, honestly. What happened in those waters when God made promises to them uh, through their parents is now owned by them themselves. So they're going to affirm their baptism and tell the congregation and the world what they believe uh, about God revealed in Jesus. So we're going to have a foretaste of that right now. Uh, we have several of our youth who are going to give us uh, snippets of that ritual of the affirmation of baptism. Tyler, renounce the devil and all forces that defy God. I, Tyler, renounce the powers of this world that rebel against God. I, Olivia, renounce the ways of sin that draw you from God. God. I, Abby, turn to Christ as your Lord and Savior. I, Abby, believe in God, the Father Almighty, the Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's own Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born by the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, who was crucified, died, and was buried. He was descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. heaven. He is he is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion, of the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Can't wait. As soon as we can get a date to that this summer, we will have it out there for all of us uh, to anticipate. Uh, the peace of the Lord be with you all, and also with you, is your response. Uh, share God's peace with one another online now. Uh, greet your neighbor that you're worshiping with, if you're worshiping with us live through Facebook at this moment. Uh, and prepare to receive this good gift, uh, this offering, uh, that one of our youth, uh, Skylar Hogan, has prepared for us, uh, a gift of the violin. And in the midst of this offering, if you have offerings to share for the ministry here at Messiah for the Kingdom of God that we're trying to announce here. Uh, you can use the online uh, tab that Becky has set up for us uh, on the Facebook Live. If you're watching later, you can go to messiahlutheran.net and, and there's a giving, uh, uh, several giving buttons on there that you can find and, and give safely online. Or you can mail in your offering. Many of you, uh, many of you are, are out of work um, and this is very troubling financial times. And, and know that no offering is expected of you. Uh, you are part of a community of faith uh, that supports and loves one another. Let us hear this good gift from Skylar.
Thank you, Skyler. That was a good gift. We have so much talent and blessings in this place. Let us pray. Holy God, make us your instruments in this world. Give us a heart for our neighbor so that we hear them when they grope for you. That we offer them a love that comes from Jesus by the love we show for them, by the words we share with them. Lord, give us your heart for our neighbor so that they might live life with peace. We pray especially this morning for our uh, government and the leadership we hope from them as, as we open up in the months ahead. We pray for those whose safety is our top concern. Those uh, who are entering the workforce after being out for a while, that, that conditions for them might be made safe. For frontline workers that have been there all along, from garbage collectors to UPS drivers and Kroger stock people, to doctors and nurses, and hates. Keep them safe, Lord. And we pray especially for those who are most vulnerable to this COVID-19, those with conditions uh, that make uh, this very dangerous. May all of us have a love for their vulnerability as we move about the world. And we pray for all those who are on our hearts right now, John Sang, Karen, which is Carol's friend, Cindy and Jackie Fisher, Ron Racy, Bob Freitag, John, Teresa, Novella, Sherry, Glenn and CJ, Jim Gardner, those who are isolated and feeling depressed, Kimberly and Meg and Susan and Lauren and Holly and Julie and Jennifer and Joanne and Al and Steve and Dan and Carolyn, and Louise, and Ralph, and David, and Al Smith, and Kevin Wright's family at the death of his brother, and Carol Wright, the widow of that brother, and for Virginia Finney's family at the death of Virginia's mother, Rhea Ripple, and Larry Rad for Larry Radcliffe as he prepares for heart surgery, as the Smith family, as they gather around Christine in these last days, for Bob Drum in his grief after the memorial service this week, and others named aloud or, or said online right now. You hear all these names, Lord. Wrap them in your love. Assure them that you are the God they grope and long for and that can bring them peace. Amen. We have our Confirmation Youth leading us in the Lord's Prayer today. Our Father, who art in heaven, and hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses. As we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We want to give thanks to Adam uh, Schled, our youth director, who, uh, who made all those videos for us today. Uh, that is a good gift. It's, it's a lot of hard work. I, I've edited a few videos, and it takes me hours. So, so, so we appreciate Adam's efforts uh, this week to make all that happen. Um, and we want to keep all those Confirmand youths in our prayers. Not a lot of announcements before you scatter. Uh, we're going to have Pub Theology on 7 o'clock Wednesday night. If you want to be part of that, we're going to be talking about prayer. Uh, you can send me an email, and I can uh, give, you a, um, uh, give you an invitation to the Zoom meeting. Uh, tune into our Facebook group daily. There's daily devotions there. 
On Wednesday, we do a 1 o'clock uh, Bible study on that site. Uh, and all this stuff makes its way to our uh, YouTube uh, station, Messiah Lutheran Reynoldsburg, Ohio, and to our website eventually, messiahlutheran.net. Um, you are a good gift. Uh, the world is opening up a little bit here already, or not, safe or not, honestly. <laughs> the world is opening up, and, and Messiah is working on opening up too. Uh, next week, uh, we are going to have a live baptism in the space with uh, family members that are going to encourage uh, and, and make promises for all of us uh, virtually that we will make in baptism. So we, we, we record, uh, welcome the Connor family into worship next week. The following week, May 31st, is Pentecost Sunday, and uh, we are going to have an, a second service on Pentecost Sunday. We'll have a, a, a service like this one that you see that'll celebrate the festival day of Pentecost, and then we're hoping to have an outdoor service uh, where you can come in your cars and sit safely uh, or bring chairs and socially distance uh, around the shelter house. Uh, for, that, for that service that'll be after this first one on Pentecost Sunday. Uh, you'll hear more about that as we unfold and we get details and people committed to help make that happen. Uh, and after that, you'll start seeing live music uh, in the sanctuary space. Our musicians will start coming back. And we hope uh, by the end of June, the 1st of July, that, that people who feel safe and able can come in and worship in this space too. So that, that's kind of the unraveling of this, uh, and hopefully it'll be a good thing and a good gift. All we can do is trust God in the midst. Uh, let's end today with our Easter greeting that began us. Alleluia! Christ is risen! Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia! May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you all with favor and grant you God's peace. Amen.
You have been found and loved by a God who fills your God-shaped hole. Now go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. We'll see you in worship next week.